Hey everyone, hi, this is Tinath and welcome to Conversations with Tinath. And in Conversations with Tinath in association with Freebirds.co, we bring you people who have excelled in their lives, people who have done exemplary work in their lives and uh, people who are, uh, you know, they have done things that you and I probably have not dreamed of. And here is one fantastic lady today that we have in our midst. She is uh, Priyanka Borpujari. I'm so happy and so proud and so privileged that she's with us because she's a person who's a globetrotter. She, she keeps moving around the whole world. She keeps walking around the whole world. And she has done exemplary work. She has done things that um, I am very proud of as an Ohomia, as a person who is from Ohom. And uh, because Priyanka Borpujari is also from Ohom, I'm so proud that she has achieved at such a young age, such a fantastic feat. And, uh, and before we go ahead, I'd like to warmly welcome Priyanka Borpujari. Thank you, Priyanka, for coming to my show, Conversations with Tina. I feel privileged, I'm honored, and I'm truly, truly humbled. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. I think all these words that you are telling about me, I think uh, uh, really a lot. I haven't done a lot of things. A lot of people have achieved a lot. They just don't uh, get noticed. So I think the unsung heroes are the bigger ones. But uh, uh, even so, I, I humbly... Um, take with a lot of gratitude all that you've said and thank you so much for having me on your show i'm really excited thank you so much <laughs> and i'm sure our viewers are also very excited to know who priyanka borpujari is she is a jury of a home and uh, i always love saying this because whenever we have one proud moment to uh, celebrate from assam we really do it with a lot of pride and priyanka borpujari is now presently in mumbai but um, uh, she will again do a lot of globe trotting before she does that and before she decides to disappear from my screen i'm going to introduce her to all of you and and we will go on we will uh, move on with this uh, with this uh, show and you'll get to know priyanka borpujari better so priyanka borpujari is an award winning journalist a former fulbright scholar and is currently a Rotary Peace Fellow based at the International Christian University in Tokyo, Japan. I'm not going to read out the entire profile because it's huge, it's mammoth, it's, it's out of our dreams. And uh, because she's achieved so much, so I decided that, you know, I'm going to take bits and pieces from her profile and we are going to discuss about it. So Priyanka, you were also the 2012 IWMF Elizabeth Newfer Fellow and a research scholar at MIT. You were the first Indian and was chosen from among 85 international applicants. Now, young people watching you right now would like to know your education timeline. Please let us know about this. Yes. Um, yeah, so by profession, I'm a journalist and I actually am proud to be uh, Assam's daughter, but I'm also Mumbai's daughter. So I think I carry both identities with me. I am what I am because I proudly call myself an Assamese Mumbaiker. I'm incomplete one without the other. So both identities are, I think, both places and both cultures have influenced me deeply. And I carry that quite uh, proudly. Um, so I studied until 10th, was, was just about all right in maths. I think wanted to be a doctor among one of many different things that I wanted to be. And I think around, um, and I actually did my 11, 10, 12th in Cotton College. So I really miss the, the chana chur and the chart, you know, the specific, it's a very specific, Specific as some, uh, like Gohati chart. It's very different from the Bombay chart right outside Cotton College and Momoghar. So I really miss all that right now. So I spent two years there, which were quite influential in my uh, development because I was a teenager. And then because I think the education system is so difficult on Indian youth that you have to get very good marks to be able to get into medical school, I couldn't get that marks, those marks. I was always very creative, uh, but I think in Assam and definitely in India, there's an understanding that if you don't get 95 and above, you're a dull student. And so they completely ignore the creative aspect of that. 
Um, thankfully, because my parents have been in Bombay, like I've, I've like grown up in Bombay, like all my life is here. I came back and I studied something called bachelor's in mass media, which was, uh, which covered a huge ground of, you know, mass media uh, class courses and everything. And so I graduated from college with a BMM degree in 2006. And six years later, I got this award. So between uh, graduating and getting this award, I was doing a lot of journalism. And at some point, I also left my job. Uh, and the job was being a crime reporter at Mumbai Mirror. So I was covering the, 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 the biggest highlight of the news of the day was the terror attacks in Bombay, you know, at that time. So I've covered that. And, uh, and then I just realized that I really wanted to travel a lot, but more importantly, I saw journalism as a mission to community, to our idea of democracy. And I felt that the real stories were not being told. And what were the real stories? For example, it would be the floods in Assam right now, or what's happening with the forests in central India. We don't talk about that enough. So I think uh, this award that I won was given to every uh, to, to one woman journalist every year who covers, uh, who's dedicated to human rights and justice. And it's named after Elizabeth Mufa, who's covered the Bosnian War and the Rwandan War, and then she died in Iraq. Um, I also just wanted to quickly say that uh, during my college days, during ever su every summer break, I did not sit at home. I was always taking internships. So I had internships at a marketing firm, at a public relations firm. And I think that was so important for me because that allowed me to see that how different the world is from our, um, our safety of family and the safety of uh, kind of like a cocoon of the of the university, right? Because the outside world is different. And working on those projects, having those two months work experience kind of prepared me for the world outside. And having that on my CV that I've at least done two months internship actually got me a job thereafter. And I did not do a master's immediately. In fact, now I am in Japan as a Rotary Peace Fellow where I have this brilliant opportunity, a fully funded one, with a great stipend to do my master's, um, what, about like 14 years after I did my graduation. But I wouldn't have come here to this point in life without everything in between. So I know I've just rambled on in different directions, but I thought that's just kind of a background to who, what some parts of myself. Amazing. You know what I suddenly felt when I was, uh, when, when you were saying every summers I never stayed at home and I kind of went and did internships and I did this. I found that I have been as a young person, I have been very lazy. I have been at home, I've watched television and I've done not, nothing. And now I, I want to go back. I, I want am not loving Ohomia Swali. So laziness is like my birthright. Okay, so let's not talk about laziness at all. <laughs> Been very lazy. Now I'm sure uh, young people watching you will not be as lazy as me because I don't want them to follow the same steps as I'm doing. I want them to follow your steps because you are a fantastic influencer. The way you have spoken, you have inspired. I'm sure there are a lot of young people sitting there and watching and saying, hey, I wasted a lot of time during this COVID period now, let me buck up, okay? I've seen Priyanka and I need to buck up now. Mm -hmm. I need to do something. So, wow, that was a fantastic thing you said about your, I mean, your the timeline of your education. That's really nice. We come to the next question and this is like a question answer session for my royal guest today. Um, you have uh, reported extensively on issues of human rights and justice from across India, El Salvador, Indonesia, and Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Argentina. And these stories have been published. I read quite a few of them and they were so interesting. I wish I had more time, but I'm going to read those stories again. And these stories have been published in various international uh, publications, including National Geographic, Al Jazeera, CNN, the Boston Globe, the, the Guardian, TRT World, the Hindu, and several others. And we would love to hear from you about how interesting this gets. You know, you write and you're, you're globetrotting. How do you do all this, you know? It's very interesting to know. Um, thank you. I think it's it's been consistent work, right? I mean, my career began in 2006, and I first worked with the Asian Age in Bombay. And then I... And then I just had a yearning to go and live in Delhi. I had never like been to Delhi before. And so I just realized that I don't want to go there as a tourist. I want to go there to live there because I feel that's the only way you get to 
know a place better than what's in the media. So I found a job there and my father was like, when I told him I got a job, I was just 21. He's like, are you asking me or are you telling me? And I told him, if I ask you, you're going to say no. So I'm telling you. And so you can imagine the whole, you know, Indian drama in the family. And finally, you know, he was the one who came to drop me off in Delhi and you'll find me a place to stay and all. So I think I always had that sense of making my own way and what we now call as hustling. And I think... There's a lot of like people who feel just being out on social media, you can be famous and all. I don't think I work towards anything to be able to be someone to be invited in a show like yours, you know. It's just, it's just a coincidence. It's just, a, it's just like a sidebar, you know. My whole, I think I've like stayed true to what I've wanted to do is to tell people stories because they matter. And that's definitely been beautiful and challenging in many ways. I, I did not published in National Geographic in the first day. I published through so many different publications, did what people would say, you know, walk the path, uh, learn the rope, uh, uh, you know, ropes of the trade. And then finally you get to a point where you're consistently uh, delivering and you make yourself believable. You, you have a strong work ethic, uh, journalistic ethic that we stand by. And I think that's what people realize, okay, she is someone who is credible and we can assign her work. Um, the other thing is that people think that now everyone is always talking, hey, journalists will have come now, you know, they're just, just talking things out of their mouth. I think that's true. Not, there are some people who are literally jokers on TV in the name of journalism. And um, some of them from the land of Assam itself were out there on TV. But then I think um, what happens is that I think people forget that the sense of ethics is so important for us in our industry. It's like a doctor, right? If a doctor makes a small mistake, his whole, his whole business is gone and nobody's going to rely on him ever. Uh, every time I have a story publishing the next day, I'm almost, I almost cannot sleep because I'm like, did I make a mistake? Was that 1,000 or 1,500? You know, the small, tiniest of details. And in the online world, now you can make those changes. And when it was print publication, you cannot make those changes. So I'm actually, I'm glad I come from the tradition of just print publication where if it's on print, it cannot be changed, right? So the sense of getting the facts accurately Till the point that I feel yeah, I can like give my life for that fact, that was so important, you know. And I think that is what got me. And uh, each of the other countries that I've traveled to, I'm very proud to say, I would say, for my work that I haven't spent a penny of my own to travel to those places. People have invited me. I've always had my travel cover. I could have spent my own money, but I was like, if I am so good, you are going to invite me with the funds that are always available for other people to tell the same stories. And I felt that was really important. Uh, and I think that was important because that it, it, it was that whole cyclical thing, right? Why it was coming from. Yeah, I don't have any relative in Bosnia. So why would someone from Bosnia call me? But then I had proven myself enough to be invited there. Yeah. Wow. Well, as you talk about your 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 journey in the in the print media, I was working, Priyanka, I must tell you that I was working for Hindustan Times for a year as a stringer. And I really wanted to, you know, uh, kind of carry on with this career. But then, you know, things got dirty when people, uh, you know, you, you know how things work in, in, the, in, the, in the newspaper industry and how things work out. So it, it, I just couldn't, uh, you know, go ahead with this. I really wanted to have a career in journalism. But then, you know, but I had to... Why do I, I just want to quickly interrupt and say I'm sorry for experience. But you know what? Every industry is dirty. It's what we make out of it. I think yes. right now what people see, I think the bio that you, of my bio that you have in front of you, and I don't know when you share the video later on, if you're going to post the whole bio so people see it and the links to it, what you see are only my wins. You haven't seen the whole big basket of things that I haven't achieved. You haven't seen the dirty politics in office and everything, right? And yes. life will always be messy. It's about how you walk through it, you know? Um, every industry is messy. I mean, tell me one industry which is clean. Like, come on, even temples and, you know, priests are, so there's corruption everywhere, you know. So I think it's where I want to go and where I want to go, not just from my selfish point of view of making money, but 
what am I giving to a community? I think I've been raised as a very, very privileged child. I see that now as I see people dying right now, not because of the disease per se, but because of hunger, because they have no food. People who have walked thousands of kilometers to go back home. We are so privileged as compared to that. I think it's just my obvious duty as a human being, as a citizen, to tell their stories and do it well. And in doing that well, I've ended up thriving also. So I think, and I'm saying that because I know this is for uh, the youth who get disillusioned. I also did, but I realized, you know what, this is just one life. I will have to make it, you know, yeah. I so agree with you uh, about this one thing that what you make of it is exactly how you deal with the whole situation. I think you're very right about that. And I dealt it well. I uh, gave a last bit of my fight, but well, I don't want the young people to be disillusioned with my talk. I want them to be very impressed with what you are doing. So we will go. And about your story, when you say that you are not somebody whose story needs to be told, but your story is so interesting that I want young people to be influenced, to be inspired by your story. Your story is very inspiring. I mean, you have not had a single day of, I think, uh, misadventure. I, you might have had those. I mean, misadventure is a... Lots, lots of it. Oh, lots yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> lots of it. I mean, but that's what I said, right? We don't, we don't put our misadventures in our bio, right? Anyone who's making a CV, you don't mention the fact that you lost all your belongings on an overnight bus from Guwahati to Jorhat all your life's work on the laptop. You don't mention the kind of trauma that comes with that on the CV, right? So I think everyone has those kind of losses. You don't realize why you didn't get a job and someone else got it even though you're good. We don't put all those on the CV, right? We only put the good things. So I think all of us are that complete package of everything. <laughs> Yes. Uh, so you are the fighter and I want all these young people watching you to be fighters like you uh, so that they know that they have to go through life in not an easy way. They have to fight it out. They have to stand by their principles, their ethics, and they have to get along. So we will go on. We'll move on to the next. In 2015, Priyanka, you were one of the India-Germany media ambassadors and a guest journalist with the German Political Weekly, Dies it? Have I said it correctly? Dies it? Dies it? Dies it? It's 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 the Zeit and the it the means the time. Okay. Yeah, it's it's not our life. It's yeah. <laughs> Zeit. Okay, I learned a new word today. The time. Would you elucidate on this, please, Priyanka? Yeah. So I think this was like a new program on India. Uh, me. Uh, sorry, on. Uh, India Germany uh, journalist exchange program and so there were like two rounds of interviews and application process and I was and seven of us were selected seven Indian journalists to go to um, uh, to Germany and seven from Germany to come to India and I think it was quite interesting to be in a place where there is very little English and in spite of that I had to have an everyday living and I also realized that there was a sense that they felt that because and I had I'd gone, I'd gone there as an exchange program, not as an intern. But I think they had not been told very well and they assumed I was an intern. And I just put my foot down and said that, you know, I'm here as an equal. And I think I had that strength to be able to say that because I knew I had done my work. I couldn't have said that if I was 21 years old, just with one year of experience, you know. So I think a lot of, a lot of students nowadays feel that, oh, because I have like studied, I've done a master's with no experience, people should treat me well. Of course, people should treat all of everyone well and with kindness. But no one is obligated to hand over things to you easily. So I had to find my own way around and try to understand a German culture, which is so very different. Before that, I lived in the U.S., right, for, with, at MIT. So that was a relatively easier and different because it's in English. But it meant really, uh, for the first time, a humbling experience to um, be in a culture where I don't know the language. So for the first time, I realized what it means to be someone with no privilege of sorts because you can't even ask for something so basic, you know, for your, like, where, where can I get this bus to go from here to there or stuff like that. So I think it was a very eye-opening experience and I traveled quite a bit across uh, Europe. Not a lot, I mean, but uh, I was in Hamburg mostly. I, I really loved Berlin. 
And uh, yeah, and I didn't speak German at all. So that was a bit of a challenge. But I think it was very interesting to see a different part of the world. And I saw how different Europe is from the US and how it relates to India. So all of that was really interesting. Wow. Wow. You, you have traveled quite a bit, huh? So uh, <laughs> that's quite interesting. I mean, you uh, and the, the travel, I think, makes a person very rich. And that is why you have you were filled with knowledge. And I would always appreciate if young people travel more because I call myself a subhikuli because most of the time I, you know, I'm mostly in Guwahati and uh, I'm I'm working here. I've got my work base here, so you know, even if I need to travel out, I'll be like, uh, I I travel. I do travel, but not as much as what you have done and the experience you've garnered. This is amazing, wonderful. <laughs> Well, but I also think there's a lot of merit to really knowing your place well, right? I mean, that is something I don't have too much now. Because mm -hmm. I think if we look at these times during COVID, people who have been able to sustain themselves have been able to do so because of community living, you know? So you are part of a community and the community is part of you. And I think we often, for pe and not everyone gets to travel. It's just that... I love to travel and wanted a life of traveling. Some people do not want, you don't have to want to travel. I mean, it's good wherever you are and whatever it is. It's, it's what you make of it, right? And I think what's happening right now is a lot of us are so disconnected from our immediate surroundings. I grew up at a time in Bombay where I was only... I spent most of the time in my neighbor's house, you know. I hated my mother's cooking, so I would eat only my neighbor's food. But we were part of each other's families. Today, people do not know their next door neighbors, you know. They don't know what's happening on kilometer radius. You know, if you don't know who, and if you're not even concerned directly, there used to be a bhajiwala sitting over there. I've seen him for the last five years. He's suddenly gone. I wonder where he's gone. If you don't even think about that, then then that's a problem. Then if you cannot even think about the person in your own community, traveling is not going to change anything for you then. I mean, you meaning anybody in that sense, you know? So I think it's just that if you have your community in Guwahati, my community is a bit wider, but the point is, comes back to humanity and whether we're caring for each other or not. Wow. I love, I love the way you think, you know? It's, it's beautiful to you know, uh, relate to your thoughts. So in early 2016, Priyanka, you were a Fulbright Scholar in residence at Nazareth College in Rochester, New York, USA, yeah. where you taught a course titled Media and Human Rights. And um, along with the viewers, I would love to know and hear more about this. Uh, yeah, so I think the Fulbright Scholarship is quite a prestigious one and I got a chance based on my work experience to become a teacher there. I also had a short stint teaching at Tata Institute of Social Science in Bombay. I was teaching a small module. And I think it was interesting that usually to become a teacher in a college, you have to go through so many exams. The beauty about the American system was that I could get an opportunity based on my work experience. So yes, I can give credit to the American um, weightage on, call, on you know, uh, uh, work experience rather than only ac uh, academic record. But I think they were also able to see that I was bringing value in there. Um, and during the time in Rochester uh, for the six months, I also did a writing workshop inside a men's prison. I think that was really eye-opening and beautiful to be working with men who are in jails. And this was in winter where it was like snowing all the time, but to be able to, because I was already doing working, uh, writing workshops with underprivileged communities before, because writing for me is catharsis. It's like healing for me. And I felt it might be for others also. So teaching in the classroom environment of the college and then teaching in the jail, uh, it was just so interesting and so different, you know? And I, I really valued the idea that students could be encouraged to ask a lot of questions and also come back with their own ideas. I introduced them to a lot of concepts about India. And, and it got me thinking that, but do Indian students know about these things themselves, you know, let alone an American student? Because I think all of us are in a bubble right now. So I introduced them to reading a lot of books. They were not too happy about it, but I'm like, well, I'm the teacher. You got to do what I'm telling you. So uh, yeah, a lot of documentary films. So yeah, that was a very great experience. 
to. Wow. Wow. I mean, uh, the, when, when you speak about students, you know, I have a group of students who are, very, I teach mass communication in a college. So um, as you, as you were talking about teaching, you know, it's so interesting when uh, children ask questions and, you know, you can tell them your stories. I, and seriously, right now, you know, what I was thinking as you were talking about, uh, about teaching and uh, getting down to prisons and all that, I was thinking that we really need to have a webinar with you where we have these whole board of students to actually ask you questions. I think that would be a much better idea of you know, relating to your story than just a one-to-one -one talk. I mean, I, right now I'm feeling the absence of my students asking questions. I, I really want them to ask you questions, seriously. Absolutely. I'll be more than happy to do that. Um, I was actually thinking there there is going to be a Q and A, you know, broader audience session. But I'll be more than happy to, you know, um, uh, be part of another webinar where uh, it's a, it's a two way street and not just one directional way. I think we need monkey bath, sabki monkey bath. So uh, ah. that's necessary. <laughs> yes. yes. But no, and, and I'm going to keep this in mind. I need I need a webinar for my for my children. You know, at least for with you yeah. with you. This is so interesting. They're going to be so inspired, and um, because they don't have you know exposure to international quality people, and you are one of them. You are a person who's traveled and you've got the experience. So they need to learn a lot of things from you. And I think the children are going to miss. And if they're not watching you, I've told them to watch. And if they're not watching you right now, they're missing a lot of stuff. So anyway, but this is going to go onto YouTube, and so they have to watch yeah. it then. Yeah. yeah, that's the best. Thing. So it's not like you can't be like absent in class now because of YouTube, right? Like, I yes. yeah. <laughs> that's fine. Oh, this I really like. Uh, Priyanka, you are also the founder of Kali Rights Project. This is this is so interesting. I, I want to know Kali Rights, you know, so what is this? So, uh, this is related to the point I was making earlier about working in the prisons with men. Okay. And uh, basically, it's like, using writing as a tool for catharsis. And uh, I've worked with different communities where I do two-day writing workshops, full two days. And in fact, I also did a workshop with uh, the NGO staff, with the staff of an NGO in Guwahati also. And I've done it in South Africa, and I've also done it in, in, in Bombay in a community and also in the prison. I think the ones that I did in the prison were the longest because I could meet them every week, even though for just an hour. And I think the, the name I said Kali was because Kali is known to be, uh, have a persona where, you know, she's not wearing anything and she's not scared. And I think that's what we got to, it's like about wearing your truth on your sleeve. The only covering you have, I mean, you really have nothing to hide because I think all of us are wearing masks, right? We're hiding something. So it's about, you have to, you just have to be naked with your own self, with what you're feeling and going through and that's the only way to process life's difficulties and be creative uh, some people find catharsis in dancing some in cooking some in painting many different things right for me it's writing so it's just kind of like a nudge for people who are interested also in exploring the same art form and uh, that's what i did i haven't done many more of those workshops since because i've been busy with other stuff uh, but then now, given that everything is just online, I might move into a different model. So let's see. Yeah. <laughs> I love the way you write, you know, and uh, reading your your writings in, in different forms. I think you, you've put them across different uh, forms. So I, I am very inspired by you. You know, you might you might say you might laugh at me and say, "Oh, how come?" You know, but no, I'm seriously very inspired. No, it's amazing. No, it's amazing. You dance so well. <laughs> no, but seriously, uh, writing is catharsis for me as well. It's very, it's a, it's a kind of a meditative experience for me, and I do write a lot. But you know, after having met you today, I probably am going to make it a point that this is the appointed time, and I'm going to write and write so that you know, um, it's going to be very, med it's very meditative for me, and I'm sure mm -hmm. it's very meditative for a lot of people. A lot of people are writing. My students are writing a lot. They write. A blogs they are into um, uh, they have their own spaces they have their own websites so you know i encourage people a lot you know, to keep writing keep writing all the time every day write a small piece so i'm inspired i write i'm writing very little write, and also write. Yeah, yeah and i think what i do in my workshops is they're not writing for publishing they're writing it for themselves 
And when you do that, you're more honest with yourself, right? It's like you could be sitting at home in pajamas all day, which is what everyone is doing. But then, you know, when somebody comes home to visit you, you obviously change your clothes, right? And there's a different way you behave. And I think that's with everything in life. But writing, I think, has to be where the, the ones that I do is where you have to write things that only you can read. And I think I've been able to create those safe spaces where they feel, okay, can you read it out in the group? Only if you're comfortable. And I think people have really written some really intimate stuff, uh, but which is necessary for them to acknowledge and then feel it's okay. So um, I'm glad to hear a lot of your students are writing. And I think I personally find, uh, I, I do a combination of typing writing on my computer, but also my own handwritten diary, because that's a lot more fun too. But this is like my stuff. It's stuff that nobody gets to read. Yeah. So uh, I think there are, there's much more healing in that, you know. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, so Priyanka, uh, one thing I love about your profile, and I read this twice in fact, is that between 2018 and 2019, you walked 1200 kilometers with two time Pulitzer winning journalist Paul Salopek on his 33,000 kilometers out of Eden walk project that traces the path, uh, the path of human migration. Interesting as it sounds. So what is this all about Priyanka? Yeah, so uh, also just to say that I also walked from Kosai Gaon in the border of West Bengal and Assam all the way along the chars of, uh, of Brahmaputra through Guwahati and Karbi Anglong. So I walked all that stretch with him and I was the last stretch. Uh, a lot of journalists, as I think you might be noticing also with the floods right now, or with any situation, we get to a place only when something is happening and not otherwise. And I think the biggest story of our of 20th century and 21st century is migration. All of us are migrants. We might say that we are more native to a place than someone else of a different religion. But how yes. native are you? Who decides how much, what period is nativity? Everyone has moved from somewhere or the other. I claim to be a Mumbaiker, but I've, my parents came here from Assam. My parents in Assam definitely have migrated from somewhere else, right? Because, you know, the only, so who is native really? So I think people are migrating for a variety of reasons and they cannot be questioned. And so Paul decided that the only way we can get to know the real story is not by flying into a place, but walking through it. And it's just like if you do an experiment in Guwahati itself, the same place that you travel every day from, let's say, your home to your college, if you decide to walk that stretch, you're going to see so many more new things because by car, by vehicle, it's all a whoosh. If you travel by train across India, you just think, ah, rural India, one landscape. I saw a very, very different side. Things were changing every five kilometers. I could see it different. Like the way there is not one Assam, right? There are so many different Assams. Uh, what goes on in Gosaigao is Assam. What happens in Tinsukia is also Assam. What happens in Silchir is also Assam. So I think, uh, and then within the Indian cosmos, right? What happens in um, Jammu versus what happens in Tamil Nadu? so different right so i think that's what it, and it was a beautiful way of storytelling to tell people stories that way to talk about forgotten artisans and and all of those things and, and um yeah it's one of the greatest privilege of my life we walked about 30 kilometers average every day um wow. so i would take a break every every five kilometers and in fact i walked quite a bit in guwahati as a part of my training so whenever i'd be visiting guwahati i would walk from let's say um you know where i'm guessing most of your audiences would know guwahati's geography right yeah. uh, let's say in bhangagar you have uh, uh, the hub mall yes. yeah uh, i'd walk from there all the way up to towards Kanapara, um, you know, where you have the Soy Mile Bridge. Yes. Uh, what's that? What's That's that? I think there's a hospital there. I think there's GNRC or so big hospital there, yeah. right? By the Soy. Yeah. yeah. So I walk on the stretch up to there and then come back as a way of training with my backpack. 
And it was exhilarating because if I'm in a car or when I'm in a bus, it just feels like, okay, GS road, straight road. But when I walk, you see so many different things. And I think that was part of what, what I said a bit earlier about that sense of community, right? Uh, you're walking on that level with people. So it was most exhilarating. Uh, in fact, if anyone wants, and, and it's fabulous to be part of National Geographic in this. So on the last two Thursdays, that's the Thursday before uh, uh, July 16th and July 23rd, there were these two webinars that were being hosted by National Geographic worldwide at 7.30 in the evening India time. They clocked in 1,50,000 viewers live because wow. everyone wanted to know. And this was about the walk in India with Paul. I was his walking partner and he has other walking partners who walked with him in different stretches of India. So he entered India from Amritsar. He had walked through Pakistan and then he walked across North India uh, down to Rajasthan and then um, uh, uh, Northern Madhya Pradesh, Bihar, bit of UP and West Bengal and Assam and then out Manipur and then Myanmar. He started walking from Ethiopia in 2013 and he's going to end it in the new world in Argentina. So, and, and he started in Ethiopia, why? Because in a place called Herjabuti in Ethiopia is where the first human remains were found um, 200,000 years ago. So, and that's where human life evidence was found and, his, and through a lot of like archaeology and all kind of research that has been done, it was found that eastward has been the path of human migration. So all of that's available on the Out of Eden Walk website. Maybe, I don't know how we can share it, maybe on chat or maybe later on. And I've been so privileged to be part of that. And I am speaking on um, this Thursday July the 30th at 7.30 p.m. is part of the panel about my experiences of it in there. So in okay. case everyone join in, I'll be happy to send in the links, yeah. But uh, maybe I can share some photographs from yes, the walk. Please, please, please Priyanka, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so I'm guessing everybody is on Instagram, most people are. So these are photographs from my Instagram handle. And uh, this, I'm just like scrolling from down to up because these are the oldest photographs walking from uh, Rajasthan onwards where I joined. And uh, uh, this is just seeing some kind of how clothes are dyed. That was interesting to see. Um, this is just watching a beautiful river going foam white with a lot of industrial effluence. So, uh, yeah, so this is a beautiful journey, meeting people, meeting villagers on the way where people are so kind, where they give us food, water, shelter. Uh, we stayed at a village and all the kids like gathered around me. They're like, Didi, aap kon hai? Kya kar rahi hai? You know, it was just like really fantastic. Um, in, in Madhya Pradesh, no, this was in Rajasthan, every house had something like Shubh Viva to announce that, you know, there has been a recent wedding in the family uh, and some places have Aapka Swagat Hai. So it was very welcoming. I mean, it's just randomly put out there. Uh, we walked with a donkey called Raju and uh, I don't know, can you see my cursor moving? Yes, yes, we can. Yeah, so so this is our baby Raju and another donkey came up to check him out and we had to just like wait him off. So it's usually just Paul and I walking, like Paul and a walking partner. We just had this another gentleman who was taking care of Raju at that time. Um, I think Ambedkar is such an important figure for India. So when I saw an Ambedkar statue, it was obvious that we were in a Dalit village and it was just fantastic that there was a whole playground uh, along with his statue. And I think Ambedkar is totally forgotten in India, his importance. So it was necessary to have this photograph and see that in some parts he is definitely remembered. Um, yeah, this this woman, she had like eight children. And then as, as you can see the, the caption, you know, she asked me, are you married? And I said, no, she's like, good, don't marry. Else you'll be stuck with husband and kids and susu potty. <laughs> and it was so assuring because women would ask me that question, you're not married, and they'd think about it. 
they're like, because in India, if you're not married, you're a loser, right? That's at least how I believed it to be. And no matter how educated people are, you're going to ask you, okay, you're doing all these good things, but are you married or not? It's like as if that's a stamp of approval. So it was really interesting to find this woman who was like, you know what, you're getting to explore the world. Otherwise, good for you. Otherwise, you'll be stuck with kids and susu potty and sas bahu. So I was like, you're a wise woman. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, again, this was uh, up in Madhya Pradesh. This was a Babaji we came across in uh, at a temple, a very wise Babaji uh, on a hilltop temple that we stayed. And and we actually stayed where these men are, are, are like taking a nap in the afternoon. That's where Paul and I spent our night there. It was, it was the summer of 2018 and it was beautiful to be sleeping under a neem tree, you know, and the Babaji took care of us. And it was one of the beautiful, most beautiful nights that we spent. Um, this is going through a stone quarry and just seeing how stone is being cut. You know, this red stone, which is so, uh, which is so expensive and sold and how these men's uh, faces are completely red. There's no protection or anything. And I think that comes down to even our sense of anything that we consume, right? What's the price that we pay for it? Um, yeah, just quick. This is crossing the Chambal River. Uh, this is the infamous Chambal River, which is known because of the Dakus and Dakus like Gabbar Singh. So it was very interesting to go through that, you know, through the ravines and that territory. Um, yeah, and I felt this was such a beautiful photograph that I just stumbled upon walking on a highway, safe express. It seems that on Indian streets, only cows are the safest, right? And as a woman, I'm not safe. Men also may not be, but cows will always be safe. So I just thought it was such a brilliant time, uh, timing. So I just had to put the caption. I have a dream to feel as safe as a cow on Indian highways. And, and that's kind of the metaphor, right? We're killing people for... Cow safety, but women's safety, nobody cares. So, yeah, I think this was the end of the first 450 kilometers of the walk and, you know, walking through a lot of mud. And then I took a break, went off to Bosnia and then joined again. This is a dhaba that we slept at. Uh, you know, I slept on, I think I slept on this charpoy and Paul slept on a charpoy there. But it was just, that's the only, that's the only thing that was available while walking on the highway. And they were like, yeah, sure, you can stay here. You can wash, you know, there was a bathroom behind. And it was just the greatest adventure of my life till, till date, you know. And all of this is walking, yeah. All of this was just walking. Um, bathrooms like this, which I think Assam is so well familiar with, you might have, you know, um, you know, what's that clean India mission, you know. Uh, but something like this is so very real. And I know I'm just like rambling on. I'll just quickly finish this. Um, I'm still updating the photographs. So this is just us entering Bengal. So I felt like I knew I'm entering Bengal or territory that I know when I see a Kali temple, or, you know, or when I see, where's that other photograph? I saw a photograph of Rasgullas. Yeah, I'm like, okay, I'm definitely entering the Eastern world. So I'm so happy. And then seeing fish. And this is something so typical of Northeast India, right? That we see this uh, uh, Jal Muriwala. So yeah, I'm still updating it. If you, t if you click on this hashtag, footsteps inward, outward, this is where you find all the pho mm, photographs of this walk from my perspective. But if you want to really know about the walk, uh, it is... It's this one. This is the walk that you can follow. Uh, Out of Eden Walk. National Geographic Fellow and Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Paul Salopek is on a 10 year walk across the globe in the footsteps of our ancestors. And he is currently in Myanmar, so the latest photographs are from Myanmar, right? Uh, and this is my profile. It's pre underscore Borpujari. Uh, that's my profile. So, yeah, so that's quickly about me. And I'm, this is like West Bengal and I'm still updating photographs a year later about, I haven't entered technically Assam with my photographs because I'm posting them, you know, in the sequence of the walk. Uh, yeah, what can I say? Greatest journey of my life. <laughs>
I must say your latest journey is very interesting. I must say this is so, so interesting. Love you. Yeah, well, well, the latest journey is now living in Japan, but then I hope to recreate this walk more often. I think once you have the drug of walking, I think everything else feels fast. And I think, uh, I, I know we're like close, we're coming to closing in time, but I quickly wanted to say that you know, I was just walking with regular t-shirt and pants and a dupatta. And we're just walking through mud all the time. But Paul and I would have such brilliant conversations. And I just felt I was doing what I loved. It got to a point where it didn't matter how I looked anymore. It didn't matter what dress I'm wearing anymore. And I felt it's only in our urban circles and in our urban lives that we are consciously thinking, how do we look, how are people... Um, perceiving us, you know, we put so much effort in all of that, we forget our life's mission. And our life's mission is to figure out, we just have one life, what do you want to do out of it, you know? So, um, yeah, I think I've spoken enough. <laughs> I just loved the, I loved all the stories. And I'm so inspired to start walking now. So I'm going to walk to college, it's not very far from my place. It just takes around eight minutes from my home to the college. But this time I'm going to make a long, nice walk to the college so that, you know, I notice what I'm, I, I think I'm going to start chronicling stories like you. I'm seriously very inspired by your, yeah. by your entire, your timeline, you know, it's very interesting. Actually, Out of Eden Walk has been doing a lot of work with schools where school students as part of their geography classes are being told to walk around, supervised with their teachers because these are younger kids, you know, not college students. But they've been given assignments to draw new maps of their areas, you know, and then, then to literally open their eyes because when, uh, like, as I said, you know, you see things differently. So I think that could also be a fantastic project for students and for something for them to do and develop artwork from it. Like the options are endless, but it comes down to, we, we cannot do anything without a community and the community is the reason why I am where I am. A lot of people have, supported me and I wouldn't be able to do anything if I didn't have a sense of giving to the community. So I guess that's very important with everything else too. I, I hope someday we can tie up with you, you know, I hope our college can tie up with you. So yes, that, uh, I'd love you know, to. They, they, they would do that, uh, that, that book, that special book that you're talking about. Yes. So, uh, so uh, the going by, uh, going by what you have been doing, Priyanka, you know, I feel that you have faced a lot of challenges. Mm -hmm. And how do you handle these challenges? You know, I can understand you've not put it on your profile saying that, you know, I had this challenge and that challenge, but then you've had your challenges. How did you handle all this? Um, I think, I think to be very honest, like for example, one challenge has been in, I really wanted to start a media company in, in Assam to try and encourage young media students to kind of, you know, do a different kind of storytelling. Uh, as much as I really love Assam and I, I'm very much from there, I realized that my everyday challenge would not be the bigger battles, but would be to ensuring getting, asking people to come on time. And I realized that my life is too short to be fighting those things. You know, you were supposed to come here at 9 a.m. It's already 10.30. And then dealing with people's egos, I think I realized that's not a challenge. I don't want to waste all my time and energy and money into it. Uh, so I'm, I'm using that example to say that the biggest challenge for me is realizing when to walk out of something that's not working out well for me, you know? And, and I think sometimes it also gets very difficult to see the goodness in everything and that is also a challenge, especially when the times are really tough. And so that, that requires a really big effort to do that. Another challenge I feel is of identity, you know. I mean, now I take it in my stride, but I think well, people would always assume that they have to put you in a box. And I'm like, I don't want to be put in a box, you know. Um, so I think, uh, I think the challenge is always how do we stay afloat and stay humble and then um, continue to stay kind because the world can be really rough. And um, I think I'm just responsible for the way I behave. You know, I, I'm not responsible for the way you behave. If you do something wrong to me, that's on you. But what I do after that, 
that's my responsibility you know so i guess it's i think it's 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 bad that i can think of top of my mind but um i think challenges are things you can overcome once you know where you want to get to uh i don't have the challenges of poverty or of not having a place i think i'm extremely privileged so and i keep repeating that because i think we all tend to forget that extre- too often and that's almost like ugly that we ignore our privileges uh so i think my challenges are really minuscule in in front of those things you know i have a house i have food i have i think i know i wouldn't go hungry in my lifetime right i think i have cousins in assam who have never traveled by a bus they only travel by a car i feel I, i'm like how are you and then you want to be a journalist when you haven't even stepped out to the real world you know and i'm so i think for me it's a challenge in sometimes communicating to people to be real and also for me to stay real you know to know that acknowledge my privilege be grateful for what i have enjoy my life and yet also know that my perspective alone is not the only perspective in the world um that's like a constant reality check i need to give myself and on tough days that's a challenge i would say <laughs> well what lovely thoughts you have waking up early is a really okay real, waking up early is a really big challenge <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I think I think that was with me a couple of uh, months back, but then now I've you know kind of gotten over that. So it uh, one challenge completed. <laughs> so yeah, you have been talking about work ethics. You know, in your in your conversation, you talked a lot about work ethics. So I would like to ask, what are the yeah. core work ethics you live by? Mm. I think I addressed this earlier before, but but. ask me more specifically if you have any ideas also but i think mostly it would be that um just because i've done something today and i've won an award for it the buck does not stop there tomorrow i still have to put as much effort into the next story and to the next thing as much in and not just in journalism but in any industry you can't be saying you know janta nahi mera baap kaun hai so in the same similar equivalent it can't be that don't you know i won such an award i think for example paul has won two pulitzer prizes for for writing for investigative reporting and yet he's the humblest human i've come across and the reason i think i speak so highly of him i wanted to walk with him and people want to walk with him is because he is so grounded you know he's not walking on you know wearing this crown of being a pulitzer winning journalist or two crowns right so i think that's a reality check i think i have to give myself in a sense of work ethic that tomorrow if i'm writing to a new publication i have to work as much hard or even harder than i did 5 years ago okay now i work smart obviously but then i'm still putting in that effort you know like what i could do earlier for one hour now i can do it for half an hour but that's like accumulated knowledge of over the years right so that's one work ethic i really work very hard and and then i really dance a lot after that but then i'm saying i balance it out i think and i think um and i think that's something i've noticed whenever i've worked in groups especially in college you know when we used to work have like group projects and i think in group project there's always be like two or three people who are working hard and two three people who are just you know pretending as if they're pushing the car but then they're actually not you know and then they just want the name out there so you always have that in every scenario but i think people would confuse the fact that because i enjoy having a lot of fun they would get mad at me when i would want things done on time or think want things efficiently uh but for me that's two separate thing when i'm having fun with you i'm going to have fun with you i'm like going to be committed to having fun with you when i'm working with you i'm going to be committed to working to working with you you know and i think that for me i i know some people do not like that it took me a long time to realize that and i used to feel hurt why why don't they like me about this i can't change it but you know what that's something i'm really proud of because people who know me they know about the fact that after i've like worked my ass off i'm also going to have great time having fun so i would say that's a work ethic uh and i think not holding on to tiny things you know 
um, like I said, because I I don't I'm I'm much older today than when I was in my first year of college or first year out of job, and I think students today feel that oh, just because I've done an MBA or a master's, I should be getting this job with this salary. I'm in a position today personally where I can hire an assistant, but if you have and show me your work ethic, why should I hire you? Why should anyone invest in you, right? What have you proven to yourself that you're investable? So I want to be a person that I, that people always feel that let's invest in Priyanka because she's definitely going to give, it's, it's you get a return on investment, you know, ROI. And I'm really concerned about uh, if, if kids today realize that. I think they're much more conscious too. Um, the other work ethic and what I do is I do as a journalist, I have to do my homework well. I really have to do my homework well because if I don't do it, I end up meeting someone do, with very shoddy work and then it's up on me, you know. So finally it's karma, it comes back to me, right? Finally we all have to clean our own potty. So it comes down to that, you know. So, and I think that's with life, right? Whether I'm have like spent, I'm eating only like, if I'm eating like 30 puri bhajis or I'm eating healthy, tomorrow's result is going to show. So I think that's at work also, right? So I know I've put it down in a very simplistic and crass way, but uh, yeah, yeah, I would just say that. <laughs> wow. I, I hope all my young friends are listening to you because uh, Work ethics is something that they need to actually inculcate because the way we, the times that we are going through, I think it's it's really nice if somebody stands out for work ethics yeah. and the very, very strong work, work ethics because um, I, I don't see uh, people, I see a lot of people, like you said, someone from Assam is also creating a lot of, you know, um, uh, news in the, in the national level. So things like that, I, I don't want somebody to work out of ethics. So uh, I want my young people, my young friends to have a lot of leadership quality in their work. And um, I think you show the way. You really, really show the way. Mm -hmm. And Priyanka, I'd like to ask you one question. If it was not journalism, and uh, yeah. what would it have been? Did Priyanka always want to be a journalist? I mean, that's a very yeah. stupid question and very cliche to yeah. ask you. You have you have spoken about this huge, beautiful journey of yours. And I'm asking you this question. No. <laughs> It's not because, you know, this pandemic has given all of us a chance to reflect on our life so far and what we want to do next. So for those of us who are privileged, who have the chance to sit down and mull over life's questions instead of running after trying to find food or walking miles home. So it's definitely a question all of us are asking. Um, yeah, I've been a storyteller as journalist since 2016. So that's 14 years. Uh, I think... I'd stopped writing a bit last year for a variety of reasons. And also I was like moving to Japan and adjusting to a new country and all of that and getting into an academic program, which was really new and different. But I think, uh, and that just made me realize, I think I always want to be a storyteller, but I think I also wanted to be a doctor. You know, a part of me always is interested in like healing people and that, but I also could have been so many different things. And I think I'm really happy being a storyteller, you know, because I get to inhabit so many different worlds, you know, how else would I get that? Um, I think I really love art of all forms and I would have been an artist, but now I look at my writing also as a form of art. So I think anytime I see any good artwork that's created in any form, I'm like, it's so beautiful. I wish I had done it. But I think I'm wise enough to realize that I cannot leave everything now and do it because I know I'm going to fail at that, you know. And I think I'm just mastering, trying to master what I'm, what I think is my thing right now. But I could have been doing so many different things. But, you know, my life is not over. So I could, maybe five years down the line, I could be doing something totally different when you talk to me again. So who knows? Yeah. I think that's the other thing about work ethic, which I realized also, I mean, I'm just remembering is that knowing when to shift, you know, when time comes, knowing when to shift and uh, pivoting, you know, you know, when you, when you hit a roadblock, you don't just stand there, right? When your car doesn't go any further, you, you shift, you, you move. I think 
that's so necessary also. Um, and getting work experience. I think for me, it was always about getting experiences rather than making money because a, a friend of mine asked me once a few years ago when I was just feeling, what am I doing? And I was like, I really want to write a book. And she asked me a very brutally honest question. Will you still write the book if nobody reads it, but just me and my dog? And I'm like, that's such a rude question because when you're an artist or when you do something, you want people to know. But then it got me really thinking, would I still do it? It's a thing. Will you stop breathing if nobody is watching you? No, right? It's like that. Will you stop traveling if you did not have Instagrams, if you didn't put up your photographs, right? So it's like, what will you do if nobody is watching, if, if it doesn't matter? So, yeah. So that's what, for me, it's like, is having these life transforming experiences. So... Who knows what I might be doing five years from now? I've always been doing something different. So, yeah. <laughs> I think more importantly, you've been in love with life. You know, as I see you, as I look at your face and the kind of glow you uh, you exude and the kind of, you know, the charm that you That's have. My face. That's because I just scrub my face. <laughs> <laughs> So even then, even then, you're a person who is beautiful inside out. I can make that out very clearly from here. At least this distance from Guwahati to Mumbai, I can see that that you're a yes. person beautiful from inside out. And it uh, really, really, I just love talk, this talk with you. It's been very meditative, you know, talking with you in this panel. <laughs> and so I, I'll come to a question which has really troubled me a lot. And this is about misinformation and fake news, which is, you know, kind of doing the rounds in all across, you know, anything you see is fake and you have to question yourself whether this particular news is correct or not and should I believe in this at all? You know, any kind of news anyone is putting out. So uh, what is your take on that as a journalist? Yeah, I just want, I'm, I'm very glad you asked that question. Um, I just want to start by saying that India has the second highest number of journalists who have been killed for doing their duty well. Now, when journalists are killed, it means that they were doing their job so well that they did not want things to be exposed, that killing them was the best thing that, you know, criminals or whoever is being exposed could do it, right? Uh, you know, like just bump that person off because that person knows too much. So, and I'm saying that because I want to put out there that there is fake news on one hand and there are journalists who are literally dying because of exposing the truth. You know, I think India has, um, I think if you look at Committee for Protection of Journalists, um, they have the latest data, but India is definitely second highest. And that's something really shameful because we pride on being democracy and space for everyone to speak. I think there's much more freedom of speech in the US because as a journalist, I can you know, say horrible things about the president and yet I know I will not be in prison, you know, but that's not the case in India anymore. And then on the other hand, you have something like fake news. I'm more surprised that educated people fall for fake news. You have vaccination and then you have Gaumutra, as if Gaumutra is going to take care of it. I'm sure Gaumutra might have medicinal properties. Maybe. Is there a scientific review on that? And I think the bigger challenge is when educated people fall for it. As I said earlier, we have the sense of ethic that if we make one information wrong, you know, let's say for a number, and especially if I'm saying like X number of people dead or killed or criminal, if, if I get the digit wrong, uh, my channel or my publication will immediately change that number on the back end but my editor will still pick me up and there goes my credibility, it goes down, right? So a lot of journalists put a lot of effort and I think those credible news organizations are there. You have NDTV, you have Times of India, um, sorry, you have Hindu, you have Indian Express. Uh, Times of India, the news section, not the advertorial section. Uh, all of us have that sense of ethics. So I guess you should know as a viewer what to believe. I get a lot of forwards. My mother gets a lot of forwards. My mother gets a lot of things on WhatsApp and she's like, this has happened. I'm like, you have a journalist at home and you sure you want to believe that? And I ask people this thing, when you get a forward in your phone, whoever sent you that, ask them, where did you get this from? 
And they'd be like, it came as a forward. I'm like, do not send that unless you can verify the fact for yourself. And then they'd be, oh, this has happened somewhere, you know, in Tamil Nadu where we don't know. If you don't know, why are you being a rumor monger person? Misinformation and fake news is a reason why one man in Bihar was murdered because people thought that he has beef in his house. That's the impact of fake news. And we're all part of it the moment we forward something. And it doesn't have to be us forwarding anything political, but any of the stupid, silly things also, you know, uh, something that might seem innocuous as that might, that may not seem as harmful that it could lead the death of somebody, but we are part of the system. If, so, if there's one idiot who's created, you know, a virus, I mean, if there's a virus out there, it's our fault if we are not wearing a mask. Similarly, if somebody's put out a fake news and if we continue to share it forward or consume it, we are as responsible. So that's what I'm going to say because I think it makes sense for me to say this from the consumer point of view when we are consuming it, right? Um, and, and everyone's cracking down. There is something called um, uh, fake news.com or uh, alt news, A-L-T news .com. Alt news. And what they do is that the moment they come across any fake video or fake information, they have their investigative journalists who are debunking it. So let's say there'll be a video from somewhere in Pakistan and they show that, oh, this is what Muslims in India are doing or something similar, you know, look at how, you know, or th that might become religious, but also like, oh, look at how a beautiful Hindu priest, you know, in a temple in India saved this dog. And they're saying that, no, that was not a Hindu priest in India. That was actually in Thailand, a monk who did it. So I think it goes on that's necessary to debunk fake news, not just for the so-called serious things, but also for these kind of cute things also, you know, like, oh, a dog is saved in Bombay. Well, it's not Bombay. It's actually Jakarta, you know. So I think the responsibility is on us. What I do when I get forward is that I ask back, where is this from? Can you verify it? If it's not verified, please do not share it. Um, yeah, I hope that helps. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I have stopped getting all this you know, misinformation and fake news because I just, you know, kind of uh, do not relate to them at all. And I do not, you know, kind of yeah. forward to anyone. So I've stopped getting any of that, you know. So I have kind of mm -hmm. stopped. I've put up a gate out there so that uh, nobody yeah. can I think for me, the gate is that before I put the gate is to question, why did you think you can forward this? And then if you, if let's say you, you sent me something, I can obviously immediately block you, right? But before I block you, or if I tell you, do not send me this stuff, my question is that, thanks for sending this. Where have you, where did you get this? Can you verify it? Obviously, you will say that I cannot verify it. I'm like, then why are you sharing this? This could have been your parent or whatever the content is, you know, and then go about blocking does not help because it's not preventing the fake news stuff. I think it's just about questioning them. Use your own head. Can that be real? You know, and I think it's that people have just, everyone has a PhD from the University of WhatsApp now and that's so problematic and these are educated people. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I hope the PhD holders again do a double PhD on not spreading uh, misinformation and fake news. You know, I hope they start doing that. They they take up another PhD on not uh, spreading that. So, um, uh, Priyanka, we're almost at the end of our uh, of our program today or in conversations with Tina. I really would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart and uh, for coming on to the show and actually, you know. Uh, I mean, sharing so much from your life that, uh, you know, I, I'm sure those people out there, my young friends out there, even uh, there are other people sitting there, just not young friends. There are a lot of other people sitting there and I'm sure they, they have kind of learned so much from you and I hope they remain inspired. They, uh, you have been a very big influencer. One last question that I'm going to ask you, it's a kind of a request from my side. What, one thing that you would like to tell the young people, some message that you would like to uh, Tell the young people. And mm -hmm. you are a girl yourself. You are very young yourself. I'm not going to say that. But, you know, there are people younger to you as well. So I'm sure, you know, you would like to send a message across to them. In what realm, in what sphere? That that maybe then I can tailor my message accordingly. 
in your sphere, you know, in your sphere, in journalism, in uh, in what are you in your leadership, your traveling, your humanity, yeah. all these things, you know, some messages. I think, I, I think uh, no, thanks for giving me the chance to give advice. <laughs> But uh, I think uh, I'm going to say something based on what comes to me is when, you know, people who are in college who are about to get their uh, bachelor's degree are asking what do they want to do or, and it's, and I'm addressing that specifically from that because I think a lot of people after they've done their BA or BSc or, you know, the bachelor's degree, I'm not talking about medicine, but apart from that, anybody else is that actually even medicine included in, in a way is that they want to get into a master's immediately or they want to get into an MBA immediately. And why? Because they think getting an MBA is going to give them a great salary where the starting salary is going to be one lakh rupees. Only if you get into IIM Ahmedabad, maybe your starting salary would be uh, that great amount and if you don't have work experience. But you will not get into IIM Ahmedabad for an MBA unless you have work experience. You see, so what I'm trying to say is that when you graduate, no matter with what degree, even if it's like a BA in psychology or BA in English literature, where the possible jobs are in academia later on, get a work experience of at least two years first. I'm doing my master's 16, um, 14 years after having done my graduation. And I'm so glad I did not rush for it because I really wanted to be clear what am I investing next my time and energy and money into, you know, and um, get that work experience at least for two years in any kind of job. So you know how the world functions, how people function until the age you're 15 or 17, you are in that safe cocoon of your family and relatives and you are, you know, Raja Beta or, you know, Gharka Chirag and all of that. You think you're on the top of the world because that's what the family makes you feel, right? Uh, and then you go into college and then in college you might be the most popular person. You may not be the most popular person, whatever it is, but you're still within the gates of security, of theory and everything. You don't know how the world works. But to be able to really function in the world, to know how to live with other humans and interact with them, even if you want to get old, only into a teaching job to know how to deal with other humans, you need a working experience. And um, that's something I want to say. And you can always come back into a job, uh, you know, in, into studies again. And then I hear people saying, oh, once I start working, then, you know, I wouldn't be able to, you know, study again. I don't think so. We have to go through those kind of data rules, figure out what works for you in that way, you know. I mean, otherwise then it becomes this, get a degree, get a master's degree, maybe get an MBA, get a job, then get a husband or wife, then have a child, then look for a school for child. Fine, that's all fine if you want it, but only if you want it and not because someone else has said that, you know. So the first step towards that is that get a job, figure out how the world works, any kind of job know how to deal with people at all levels, be it at the CEO level or even dealing with regular customers who want to recharge their phone. So um, I think, uh, sorry, <laughs> he wants to go out. <laughs> so uh, uh, yeah, so I think that's, that's the advice I want to give. After you graduate, do not go for a master's, get a job, any kind of job, even if it's not related to your degree. Wow. You know, I will call this a session, a very meditative session. And uh, Priyanka, you have been truly inspiring for me and for, my, for our viewers, for the young and the old viewers who are watching. Thank you so much for spending your valuable time. I know you are always pressed for time. You're doing some project together. And uh, we would all like to, from Assam here and from all our friends who are watching us, we'd like to wish you all the best. You'll be going back to Tokyo. We wish you all the best and uh, we hope that we, you are going to bring us a lot more pride. See, I'm behaving like an old granny and I'm going to say you're going to bring a lot of pride. And you I don't have <laughs> grannies now, so I'm happy to have more grannies. That's fine. But you're not being a granny, no, I think. Thank you so much for being proud of me. I mean, I really feel honored and I really feel cradled in a beautiful way. And uh, I think, uh, thank you for having me on your show. I mean, it's just so popular and you're so popular. So it's just very nice. So it's definitely 
hopefully it's going to be helpful to students. And again, I want to put it out there. I am open to having more interactions with you, with your students. Um, people can follow me on Instagram and on Twitter. It's P-R-I, like short form for Priyanka, Pri underscore Borpujari. Um, I may not I'm accept. Gonna put, I'm going yeah, to put this sorry. up. I'm going to put up your Twitter handle and your uh, and your tweet. Uh, sorry, your uh, yes, your Twitter and your Instagram. Yeah, Instagram, Instagram handle. If anyone wants to reach out. Yes, when I put up the description, I'm going to put that up right. Yeah, Absolutely. and you can also put all the details if maybe we can discuss that and. Uh, uh, and, and to any audience out there, if you send me a friend request on Facebook, I may not accept it because I may not see it, but send me an email and we can definitely talk. But I'll definitely be more than happy to talk to your students because a lot of adults, when I was a kid, when I was in college, also gave their time. So it's obviously, you know, passing it forward. So I'm more than happy. Yeah. And when I come to Assam, just feed me great food. That's all I ask. <laughs> this has been a totally meditative session. Uh, your kindness has, you know, kind of rubbed on to me. I am uh, circling myself with your kindness and with your love. And kind rubs kind. Kind rubs kind. <laughs> so thank you, Priyanka. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you.